How you doing? Thanks for joining me again today on the lockdown. Um, all right, it's been a little bit. It took a, a week off there for, well, you know, all sorts of reasons. Um, some obvious and some maybe not so obvious. Um, so first thing I want to talk about is I want to say thanks for everyone for being here and um, for today and during this time I have uh, my solo electric blues course on sale for 40 percent off if you buy it buy it through my website so there's a link there you just hit um live uh, the, the code's there i'm sorry phil has the code and um and the code is in the in the bio there and it's a uh, 40 percent off that course and i want to talk a little bit about that but i just played on the top i want to teach a little bit but i also want to talk about um as i was saying staying kind of grounded as a musician the simple things like things that that bring me back uh, to, you know, why play the guitar? It's so easy to get caught up in all the millions of things you need to know how to do and um, play and, and the way we self-edit and self-judge and I should be better, uh, I should be able to do this, I should be able to do that. And believe me, I, I suffer all those things. Um, then you guys caught the two rock thing last night with, uh, with Josh and, and Matt. I always feel the same way too, you know, like, um, I get a little crazy. So Phil's telling me I got no code. I must have left the code out. Hold on. I got a code going on because I'm doing a million things at once. Okay. So the code is LIVE40, L-I-V-E 40. The number is 40. And if you enter that in, in my website, and, or you could, there's a direct link to the course if you want my solo, my solo electric blues guitar course. And Okay. So... I th it's easy to get kind of distracted. There's so much stuff to be distracted by, you know, lately in the world and also uh, just as guitar players, just even talking about that, right? You, you hear somebody play. I was saying I played last night on, online with, um, with Josh and Matt. You know, these are my friends, but they're also these ridiculously good guitar players. So how do I, you know, sit into that when I think to myself, like, when I hear people like that play or anybody play, and how do I keep kind of grounded as to what I want to do and remind myself, you know, why I got into playing the guitar? And very often it's the simple stuff. And the first thing I want to just talk about here, one thing that always brings it back down to me, is playing a little blues and keeping it really, really simple. Um, even it's just as simple, I know it sounds kind of corny, but as simple as just kind of playing, like, you know, an E7 chord. new guitar. Like just sitting on that groove, I know it sounds a little corny, but I just love even the sound of the chord. So it sounds getting a little kind of philosophical. Sometimes I just stop and listen to what the guitar sounds like. You know what I mean? If I'm going like... 
and hear those overtones, to me, that's really a, a beautiful thing. And you know when you just kind of strum that guitar the first time? And I just love the sound of that. So I think about what it, it makes me think, well, there's opportunities here. So. So just sitting on one groove and, think, and just putting aside all these, I should be doing this, I should be doing that, I want to work on, on chops, which is all these things I want to work on, but when I'm feeling kind of ungrounded as a guitar player or even in, in life, I just sit down and play a blues and I just focus in on really simple things, whether, like I said, it's an E blues. So let's just check out this first E blues that I have uh, the tab for you. And it's from a course, one of my favorite things to do, and I did this a bit, a little bit in a previous uh, lockdown, one of the first ones, I'm playing a blues by yourself, but I just want to expand on what I'm kind of thinking about with this. So the first one, it, it's just, I'll play it for you. <laughs> So I'm just moving this, like, right, the little kind of happy trails, old blues, Jimmy Reed kind of feel. Now, let's just think about that. Now, how awesome is that? So for me, that gets me going. If I'm thinking about all this stuff, I'm happy just going. So that to me is a real stepping board. And what I'm going to do is add in a six. I'm going to hybrid pick this. And that'll take some time, right? Listen. So how do I, relating this back to this little kind of a ethereal idea of, of how do I stay grounded as a musician? Um, I did, what got me into playing guitar in the first place is I just love the sound of it, right? I mean, I think we all are here because we love the guitar. So what I like to do is to try to connect back to that. And this is something I've talked to, to Robin about, like, he says stuff that, like that. We played a chord. He says, listen to that. That's an E7 chord. And he's like excited about an E7 chord. And I know what he means. So if I just even listen like that, I'll, I'll do things like this. Now, how can I make that more interesting? Add a little vibrato. Like, I don't know about you, but I already feel better. <laughs> so I'm going to be a little uh, maybe zen about the whole thing, right? as opposed to just playing at playing that, right? Like... That's the lick, but... So what am I doing? Think about how I can change the way that sounds by adding in some dynamics, some vibrato on the notes. But what I'm really often really thinking about, like I said, is I'm, I'm just listening to the sound of the guitar. Right? You know my A chord.
So I'm thinking about all those different variations. And for me, when I sit on that stuff for a while, I feel like when I immerse myself in the one thing that I'm trying to do, something really simple like that, I start to see the really, what I see is to be the really amazing stuff that's contained in the simple thing, right? So people want to learn stuff on the whole. They want, everybody wants to, I know this from my own feelings. You know, you know I want to learn everything. I want to get it all the time and all the time. And what we love about our favorite guitar players, you think about B.B. King, it's not the notes, it's a cliche, right? B.B. King, of course, you know, he's amazing. And it's not because of all the notes. It's just how he plays each of those notes. So how I remain, like, keep on bringing it back to this idea of, grounded. I'm, I'm kind of winging some of this because it's such a, I want to get too, I'll, just, all right, I'll get as philosophical. I feel like, uh, you know, without getting into all my, my beliefs, I'm pretty, <laughs> my friends know me, um, I'm like a science guy. But I feel like, you know, there's a connection to your, it's, a, it's like a, I'm honored to be able to play music or I've been drawn to it because I'm trying to make a connection to another person or just trying to make an emotional connection to who I am as a person to another person. And I think people think you can't cultivate this. And I am here to tell you, you can cultivate it. You have to work on it. There's, you know, there's that illusion that we have or a myth that some people just sit down and they can just be great. Now, maybe there's some singers who are naturally born that way. I think it's more direct, but um, any singer I know who's really great has worked their butt off, you know? So the same thing with guitar players. So w it's easy to get caught up in the notes, but there's y what keeps me going is how I can, like I said, So how do I practice this? Exactly that. I think about how many different ways can I play that? And then listen to them, like really listen. Think about like, okay, well. Here's without vibrata. It's a cool sound. But you have an electric, right? You know. Right, so I'm just vibrating it a little bit. And to me, that is the difference between that's a day and night thing to me. So when I hear people who play this way, I know they've put in the time and effort that it takes to do that. And uh, I don't think I was a natural at this at all. I would practice it. I would stumble across them and say, what is cool about that? Or like when you hear B.B. King play something, what's so cool? Well, it's the note choice, of course. And then there's the way he plays it. There's the dynamic approach. Um, there's the emotional content that he puts into it. So I always think about that when I'm trying to perform something. Um, what am I trying to convey from one human being to another human being? And that's one of the things, like I, I've worked a lot on chops because I like chops, but it, I think it's one of the things that kept me away from being uh, a super chops guy. Because uh, uh, generally speaking, I know this is gonna, this always causes a certain degree of controversy. But my favorite players are the guys who, I, I don't think you can do both. I don't think, in my mind, for the most part, very few people can have these amazing, crazy chops. And then, in my personal experience, there are guys out there, of course, you know. Uh, but there's the, it, it's, it's a hard line to be super great at both of them. So, um, although I always use Jeff Beckett's example of a guy who's got amazing technique to perform what he wants, and Andy Wood and I were talking about this, but there's a real connection between the he and the instrument. He's not playing at the guitar, he just happens to be playing the guitar, you know, and that's how he's connecting from one thing to the other, from one person to the other person. Is this making any sense, or am I rambling on like some sort of idiot? But it's important, this is stuff I think about all the time, is how when I, my job in this planet <laughs> is, I've, I, I don't like to use like, the word blessed. I'm fortunate enough to have found this thing that I love doing, and I feel like I am fortunate enough to have a talent for it, but I'm here to tell you that I worked really hard at it. I don't think I'm a natural. I just spent a lot of time thinking about what it is I want to say and what are my strengths as a, as a player. Um, and my favorite players are the guys who, when I hear them, or women, or anybody, any musician, 
is that one that can make a direct connection to you as a person. So that is my goal. And I think I can really, you can practice this. It's not something like when I hear, you know, somebody great, I'm more inspired by it. And, uh, you know, yes, I've, I had the time to, like, um, living in, you know, when I was a kid, living in my mom's basement after school and <laughs> all the time in the world to practice and things like that and a supportive family and blah, blah, blah. But um, it was the time put in of just thinking about what got me into playing guitar. So very often when I'm trying to play something or I'm trying to write something, all these thoughts will be flying in my head about it. i got to make it cool, you know, uh, these are all my friends are badass guitar players and you know I've got these things these kind of these uh the same fears and the same absolute insecurities that everybody else does they don't go away like I hear my guitar playing I think I suck you know not suck like in terrible like I know I can play I ha I know where I'm at I've been very fortunate in my career uh meeting the right people and all this kind of stuff um and so I'm here also to say that none of that was by luck. You know, I work really hard at what I do. And I'm not, and anybody who is successful at what they do, as you well know, you're all smart people. They work really hard. So um, I'm spurred on by feeling, by hearing other great players. But, you know, let's be honest, you know, I'm playing with Robin. I just, it is a thing for me to get past it. And it took a while, and he's such a great guy, but still, we get up on stage, and the first thought I have in my head is like, holy crap. Like, you know, and it's only when I can turn it off, which I've gotten more successful at doing, but there's always that self-doubt. So what I do in those situations, like, I just try to be me. Like, well, what can I do that he cannot do? And what he can't do is be me. And I can't be him. And so when I kind of came to that conclusion uh, at some point, and I still battle it, but I get a conclusion that I came to that, like, I can just be, just be the, it's not like a, an infomercial, I can just be the best me I can be. <laughs> and so that's what I try to work on. And what can I do that makes me different from other people? But, you know, like I said, I hear other guitar players and I still get freaked out. You know, I look at myself and I'm like, oh, I'm terrible. And, you know, and like I said, you guys all know my friends. Look at all the people who are my friends. And so I'm also honored enough and smart enough to realize they're my friends because I can play, and I, I love them, and I respect their playing, but it's, um, I, just, I just think there's something musicians don't talk about enough, is this absolute kind of underlying self-loathing <laughs> mixed with this kind of confidence or drive and all these things, and I think it's a bit of that self-loathing that makes us get better, so... And as I'm, I'm getting out of the self-loathing thing a little more and getting in more to kind of the acceptance level in my life. <laughs> so, um, so back to the initial point. So what I do is I'll find a thing that, that gets, me, gets me going. And it usually comes down to something simple. And it's, I work on chops because I find that they're super important. I like being able to play fast and to rip and all that. But what I want to work on is, is those things I connect. So if I'm talking about, say, leaving by like vibrato. <laughs> like, I'll work hours on that. Because that, to me, is as close as I can get to a human voice, right? So by taking that small little thing about, say, really spending just time on your vibrato, what it does is it, it once again grounds me to, so when I listen to an instrument that I can't compare myself to, when I hear uh, like a great violinist or a great singer who has really you know, amazing control over their instrument, I'm inspired by that because I think, well, that's just a great musician. I don't they don't play guitar, so I, don't, I can't judge myself on that. But I'll just say, well, can I emulate what they're doing? Can I get, or can I get across the same idea as, as, what, they're, as what they're trying to say? I feel like I'm rambling a little bit, but I'm just kind of dumping. I think there's just so much going on clearly in the world. I just want to kind of touch base with when all this stuff is going on around me, what, what I do to try to... Um, 
what I try to do to keep me, me grounded as a, as a human being and as an individual, because, you know, I, I can't gig. All my friends and I are kind of freaking out at times because there's just no music going on. So I have to kind of go within and see what I can grab out of the instrument itself, you know. Um, so, uh, so what I would sometimes do, just to bring it back to like a little bit of that lesson thing, is I would I put together just a blues. Maybe use a, a springboard of that blues that I handed out that, that's on the PDF, because I always like to give you guys something to kind of work on. And then I think about, well, what can I add to that? And where, that, where does it want to go? Where does it want to take me? But the first thing I do is, you know... <laughs> What I think about practicing is I almost lost it there for a minute, right? I just kind of went for something. And then I, I practice letting go. Like, where does that want to go? And that's my favorite thing. Like, um, my favorite solos are not my most perfect ones. I feel like the ones that are just by the seat of the pants and I feel like everything's about to fall apart and explode, that's my favorite stuff. And so right there, I, I was going from the, the A chord. And I kind of, in my mind, I was like, oh boy, oop, oh, oop, oh. almost lost it. So what I'll, I'll just try to roll with it as a musician and practice letting go. Because that's, you know, that's where the magic is, right? When you hear someone connecting with the instrument and you're putting aside all the, all the bullshit, you know, of like chops or... I need to do this. Now, yes, I have very good chops, and my technique is very good because I practiced it and allowed me to m cover the mistake or allow my... S I, I have enough technique and experience to roll with what's going on, right? So, um, so I have to practice that, though, and this is what I'm trying to, to tell you today. Like, uh, you know, without... I don't... Uh, people accuse me sometimes of saying, like, oh, you're too... You're, you know, you're too humble or something. And I don't, that sounds arrogant to say that. Uh, I, I don't see it as humble. I just, look, I, if I can do it, anybody can do it. You just got to work at it. So I was fortunate enough to have some good teachers or to pick up on certain things like, or read about these things and, and think about, well, all right, the best, ac the best things are th that come around are usually from accidents or where something wants to go. And you just got to realize, you know, um, you know, who's, what's the thought behind the thought, right? You know, you're not, I'm not thinking about where I'm going to go next, or I'm going to play the third, or I'm going to do this, or I'm going to do that. I'm just thinking where this, where this music and where this piece of art or creativity is taking me at this moment. And I'm just, I'm just, I'm just along for the ride, right? And, it, uh, or some sort of conduit for it. Um, but the conduit is only there because I've worked, put in the hard work. And so there's the practice versus the playing, right? So I practice stuff all the time. I practice scales, practice arpeggios, all those things we've talked about at length here. And we'll continue because I love that stuff. But I also like to just practice just creating and making music on the spots, improvising. Um, you know, and it w I had a really, I was having a conversation with, with Rick, Rick Beato, who was quite, um, he was super complimentary, it, which was really nice to hear coming from him, of course. And he had said, um, you know, I could tell you're an improviser because you, you repeated ideas. And, and right, because 
most improvisers will have will work on building a phrase from what came before. And so I'm trying to create, maybe like I'm not so much doing right now, coherent ideas. Like one thing leads to another and you're telling a story. And you have to practice that. And a lot of times I'll just make mistakes and then you just stop for a second and kind of figure out what you meant to play or how maybe you wanted it to sound and then go back and take the time and work out some of those ideas. Other times I, I'll just see what happens and just roll with it and then try to go with it. And if I make a mistake, it's gone. It's, it's, you know, it's in the ether. It's, it's not there. And this is my little rant here about <laughs> Instagram and uh, YouTube and all these sorts of things. It's, it's a false reality or it's not the reality I necessarily want to live in when it talks about, when you're talking about being a musician and creating something. So I, I have seen a bunch of the YouTube videos or Instagram videos. These guys are totally shredding. And what the, the, the thing we don't often know is how many takes it took for them to do that. And I've done the same thing. Uh, or those are rehearsed things and they're not in the situation of, um, of a performance, right? Where you're, it's a living, breathing thing. And that's why I got into music. I just love improvising. And so you can practice, you can practice it. It's, it's like a muscle or it's a skill. You have to practice improvising. So the reason why I gave you this blues in the beginning is just one way that I did it. You could see where that started to go. It went around the, a little around the corner. So let's just, let's just take another one. Then I'll just start taking some questions if I'm <laughs> making some sense here. I mean, hopefully people are digging this. Um, okay, so we're gonna start with the same idea. That's my idea, right? Take it off this. where I wanted to go, right? So, um, just kind of rolling with it again. Where did that want me to go? So, uh, I could have gone through it and said, oh, that was a mistake. And it's very hard to stop editing yourself while you're in the moment. And that's the death of all of it. If you're playing, it's the worst gigs are when I'm playing and I'm thinking, oh, I sound really good tonight. <laughs> the second I almost acknowledge that I sound good, it's, it's, it's done. You know, oh man, I'm kind of, this feels really good. boom, because I I don't know what that is. You, know, you acknowledge it, or you're um, you took yourself out of the moment. You judged what it is that you were doing while you were doing it, whether positively or negatively. And we've all had this experience, right? You're doing a gig and you're thinking, man, I sound horrible tonight. I just cannot wait to be done. And then you, you know, people are like, man, you've never sounded better. Or you listen back on your recording, which I try to record all my gigs. You listen back, which is painful to listen to, I got to tell you. You listen back, you're like, damn, that was pretty good. And then, of course, those nights where you just go, um, uh, no, that was terrible. I was right. That was terrible. <laughs> you know what I mean? So, so that's it. So, um, 
so what I try to do, as I've just done, like I was playing it, and this is live, like I'm, I'm just improvising, and I'm letting it all hang out, and I think, I, I, I feel like, hopefully that's what you guys like about this, like I just keep the warts and all, I'm not trying to show perfection here, this is just who I am and how I play the guitar, and if there's a mistake, whatever, that's, that's what happened, and it's not, um, you know, whatever, that's it, who cares. Um, so I do have to shut it off at certain points. Like I made something here. I'm like, oop, that was, and I'm like live. I don't know how many people are on here right now. Uh, I'll, I'll listen to me rambling. So 90 people listening to me ramble, um, which I appreciate. And then, uh, you know, where does it, I'm performing, right? So I have to put out of my head that I'm just, who cares? I'm just waiting to hang out and trying to create something. So, all right. Um, and, uh, you know, just trying to be, you know, authentic, if I, if I, if that makes sense. So, all right, now we have some questions. I, hopefully this was not too rambling and a little seat of the pants, but I just want to talk about some of this stuff that, you know, once again, the recap, I just try to play what's going on at the moment and live in the moment. That's one thing I got to say, I always talk about Robin, but it's one thing I really learned from playing with him. That guy does not care about what happened before or what's going to happen. He is completely in the moment when he's playing music. And it's like a sacred space for him. Like, it's just, if it ain't happening, you, you've seen gigs, and if it ain't happening, he's not, he's, you can tell sometimes. Um, but, you know, it's a thing. He wants to establish uh, a moment, and he's in that moment full on. And when I hear... Jeff Beck play or my favorite guitar players. These are guys I I um I I see it and I hear it, you know, like Coltrane or Miles or um you know, like John Mayer and the guys playing the guys in it, you know, like there's people who are making that connection and it's not about uh pre practice things or anything. And that's one thing I've another thing from you know what I learned from say someone like Robin, there's it's not lick based at all. He's just playing music that comes out of his instrument. Um, okay, so thanks for hanging in on this. <laughs> I got some, if there's any questions and some thoughts, it seems like you guys are enjoying this, which is cool. And so my, uh, Matt Gibson, hey man, thanks for being here. Jason Carter, hey Keith, what's going on? Uh, Keith Williams, 5 Watt World, who just put out another great video today. And uh, Chris Amler, um, one of my oldest friends, he's older than me, Chris Amler, spectacular guitar player, and he and I met, I was in freshman year of high school, so a constant inspiration as a guitar player and a friend. Um, okay, do you guys have any kind of questions going on for this? Um, oh yeah, once again, just on this side, I always like to kind of throw these stuff out to you. Uh, that blues that I put in the top is, is on sale right now at 40% off, and it's on my solo electric blues course where I'm just playing blues by myself. So I look at any, each and every of those, uh, of those exercises, I call them exercises. They're a little, they're not dry. Well, maybe they're a little dry. They're just repeated. And for me, they're all springboards to be able to go somewhere else. There's a bunch of them in E and then they can all kind of piece them together. So for me, that's where you start out uh, learning the part. Right, I'm going to learn. Right. that, then where can you go with that? All right? How do I make it cooler? Well, I add vibrato. Right? That kind of thing. Um, all right. So, that's on there. 40% off if you want. Use the code uh, LIVE40. Only through my website. So that's that link there. And uh, that's, you know, you guys have been so generous and helpful. That is uh, one of the ways where how I support myself and to be able to continue to do this stuff. All right. So if there's any questions, um, I'm sure you people are asking about the PRS. <laughs> okay. Jason Lachlan here. I know Jason Lachlan and I have had many conversations about this kind of stuff. You know, why we play music. And, you know, Jason, you want to chime in, too, if you're still here. Um, 
you know, what's the reason behind it? And one of the main, you know, the reasons is because it, you just love music so much, and it's about working on creating music. All right. So um, here we go. PRS, people ask me what's up with this. Um, it is a David Grissom model, and uh, I got to say it's pretty pretty great <laughs> um the people at prs were cool enough to uh to get in touch with me so i'm honored by that and um i've played a number of david's guitars his personal ones of course and i thought they were spectacular and um this is no different it, it, i just was talking to them and it turns out it's the guitar i didn't know i was missing or wanted if that makes any sense so i've got some really nice guitars but this just you can hear the difference, and it sounds different than my Les Paul, and it sounds different than my Strats and my Tuttle. So that's what I really like about it. It's got a whole different, um, uh, got a different sound to it, which to me has been um, a ton of fun to play. So, um, I can split that pickup back there, which is actually unusual that it sounds so good. Right? And then back in. And then the neck pickup, which is... Uh, David did some smart wiring. It takes me a minute to get used to it, though. That's the volume for the bridge. And that's the volume for the neck, which is great, because he plays in the bridge all the time. And it makes sense. So here's the, uh, the neck with the split. There you go. Right, and then back down, which is great. It's not, um, it's not a super boomy neck pickup, so it's really, really super great guitar, it's, you know. And it's got a tremolo on it. Okay. Um, so Robin talked about some of this on one of his streams. Uh, yeah, he talks about this. We've talked about this stuff a lot. Um, so. It was kind of part of the inspiration about it was I, I do so much teaching and uh, sometimes uh, I, I forget to talk about, you know, making music and, and creating art, uh, which is really what it's kind of all about. And it doesn't need to be art on a grand screen. It doesn't need to be, I need to be playing for millions of people, which I don't. Um, but even in my house, if I, I, that's super satisfying to me when, um, if I can just sit here and, and uh, play guitar by myself and be and be interested right so I'm always trying to keep my that's oh, here we go I'm always trying to keep myself interested how's that that's a good way I'm trying to keep myself interested in what I'm doing and what makes it interesting for me is to figure out a different way to maybe play something and those are always my favorite players or musicians the, the person who just sounds a little different from somebody else and that's what I'm striving for. And the only way you can do that is to cultivate that, you know. Um, you know we, we talk about, you know, once again, Robin, he didn't listen to any other guitar players, he, except for Mike Bloomfield, and he just would play guitar he, and, and come up with stuff his own way. So that's how he developed his voice. Um, I grew up in the 80s with all the Shredder guys, and um, so, you know, I fell into that whole trap of wanting to sound like other people. And so finally, one day, I came to the conclusion that my favorite guitar players all sound like themselves. So at that point, I started to go, all right, you know, Okay, this is from, thanks, Phil, for the questions. Um, okay, so uh, this is from Kit, um, and I'm glad you guys are enjoying this. Um, you still find vibrato uh, and bends really difficult. Any advice? Oh, yeah, for sure. Most often the case, and this to me is a real technical answer, it's, it's that you're maybe having your hand in the wrong position. I found this like across the board. It's like one of the main things I end up teaching people all the time. So if we're going to play right, that note, I'm going to bend this A here. So what I'm doing right there, thumb comes over the top of the neck. And I'm not bending with my fingers this way. Uh, they're locked. And I'm bending with my forearm. And some people that find they have their thumb over there. That's not going to work because you're, you're putting all the energy over here. You want to focus it right here. So I'm right up on the fret. 
my thumb is almost always sort of right between my first and second finger. Oop. Right, so I'm getting that. It's like a doorknob or like it's like a hinge, right? I'm working like that. I'm pulling, I'm almost pushing down a bit on the neck. Right? It's not coming from my fingers. My thumb is not in the middle of the neck like this. Some guys do that. It's not the kind of vibrato I do or the kind of players that do. I like that kind of big, you know, big kind of extreme vibrato. And, and I find I get much more control over it that way. So thumb over the top between your first and second finger. Finger right up against the fret. That's also important. I feel like if you can see any fret going on in the bend, you're not maximizing the power you need behind the note. So the bend is the same. So that's the vibrato. Then I'll practice each finger. All right, so I've done that. This sounds silly, but that's different than that. And the first finger vibrato is very different. So you want to practice each one individually and just practice that for like an hour or every day, not an hour every day, but practice it every single day. And um, make sure it's in tune, make sure your vibrato is not, right, that little sharp vibrato. Right, make sure as you practice it, you're staying in tune. Now the vibrato, the bend is the same thing where you're just gonna have the same technique, but now you're gonna push further. And what I'm doing there, I'm gonna play the note that I'm gonna bend from I'm going to play the note I'm going to bend to. Right? Now I have that vibrato. But really slowly, and I do each, I work on it individually. Uh, isolate each bend with each finger. Don't forget, I'm not bending with the actual finger. I'm always reinforcing it with another finger. And uh, that should help a lot. If you look at one of the earlier lockdowns, I don't remember which it was, I talk about bends and vibrato in, in super great detail. So you might want to check that out. But that's the main thing. I found for most people, it's a technical problem. It's just your thumb is in the wrong place. You're not bending the quite the right way. Okay. Um, this is from Tom uh, with three S's, four S's. <laughs> Can you talk about playing with a duo or a trio in a live setting? All right, well, mainly when I play, it's trio because it just kind of worked out that way. Um, I always love trios. I also like playing with a keyboard player who only plays organ or Rhodes or B3. I don't, you know, I'm not, a, not the synth guys. Um, so that's when I'll bring in things like pedals um, to uh, just create a different sound, of, like sonic landscape. I think sometimes my ears get a little tired if it's always the same kind of thing. So that's sometimes where I'll, I'll, I'll add in some pedals. But I feel like um, I'm, when I'm playing with a trio, I'm definitely walking into it differently than playing with a quartet, uh, another guitar player or a keyboard player. I found not all keyboard players, a lot of keyboard players. I've played a bunch who are a little more jazz oriented. And sometimes they'll start to add in extensions on chords, you know, like to be, and <laughs> David Grissom and I have talked about this. He's like, triads, don't play any, don't play any thirds either. Just play roots and fifths, you know, like, cause that's the way he likes to hear. So for the kind of music that he plays and the kind of music I play, that's what I want to hear as well. So if any of you guys know uh, one of my tunes, Highlands, I've had, if I play with, with a keyboard player, which I really enjoy, Sometimes I have, I have to say, like, no, 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 no 11s, no, you know, when you do your own solo, you, it's all great, but you're playing behind me, just play the triads, because that's what I think sounds best on this song. So I'm going to walk into a different way. If I'm playing with another guitar player, hopefully we've had some time to talk about it. Um, you know, uh, like my friend Chris, who's online, uh, and uh, Jason Locke, and we've, we've done gigs together. And it's always a ton of fun because we both, we, we trust that we're going to listen to each other. And if he's playing up here, I'm going to go down here. We're going to look at each other and interact. Um, so yeah, hopefully that answers that question. So Michael Cope, um, hold on. Uh, where is Michael's question? Uh, do you try to put yourself in a certain headspace before you perform? I, I try. 
Um, the, one of the problems with, with New York and a lot of the times, there's no backstage. You're just, you know, all right, your turn. And you get up on stage. So it's really hard to mentally prepare in any way for most gigs that you end up doing in New York. Or unless you have the benefit of having a, you know, a, a dressing room, and a, which, which doesn't really happen that much, you know. Um, but if I do get that opportunity, I do like to warm up. Because I don't like walking out on stage cold, which seems to happen all the time in New York. Um, you know, because, you know, that's just the way it is. There's no backstage, so you're just ready to go. You go up and you're like, all right, here we go. You know, you just kind of warm up before you go on the, sh on the gig. But if it's cold out, that doesn't really do much good for you. So uh, what I end up doing is I try not to play very difficult songs until like the second or th like to the third song. Because the first thing that's going to happen for me is there's always the energy of the first tune, which I love. But if it's a tune that's technically demanding, Sometimes I'll just mess it up. Uh, if you're on the road a lot, that's when things might change because you're feeling more confident if you kind of have your, your, your gig stuff on. So by the fifth gig, you're probably like, yeah, man, I can do anything, whatever. Let's just, let's just play the hard tune first. But if you're walking into a gig <coughs> that you haven't been doing in a long time, I will try to play um, a song that's maybe not so technically demanding first because that, will, uh, that can set the, my mental state for the rest of the night if I don't. Excuse me some raspberries from the backyard. So, um, very summary looking. Um, so, that'll send my, 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 uh, my mental state. So if I really put you poorly and trying to screw up on the first one, sometimes it'll mess with my head. Um, also, even on gigs, unless it's a complete disaster, uh, that's why I like to at least be rehearsed beforehand, um, I try to be able to step out of it, you know. Um, if you make a mistake, you just move on. Uh, you know, sometimes if it feels bad, if you, yeah, if you got the wrong drummer or the wrong bass player, or if they don't know the material as well, and then that's my biggest thing, is if the guys don't know the material, that sucks, because then I'm leading a band, and I'm out of uh, being a creating, and I'm looking to, to them to, I have to make sure they go to the right song, right part in the song. So I have charts and all that, but sometimes, you know, then you're just reading it, so it's better when you, you when everybody's prepared to a certain extent. And like I said, then I'm, you know, I'll gauge how I'm feeling that night too. If it's if I'm feeling pretty confident and pretty limber feeling, it's you just feel like, yeah, I feel pretty good, then I might dive into the, the tougher song first. But um, if you want to talk about how I'm gonna how I prepare to go on before a gig, I will practice my tunes. Um, because some of them are a little demanding, you know, I just, uh, you might forget, or you just don't have it under your fingers. Um, you know, there's that tune of my Marta. <laughs> ah, see, I messed it up. Right, I want to run over that before, if I haven't played it in like three months, um, then yeah, I want to practice it. So I want to be on the tunes. I want to have them fresh in my head and on my, under my fingers. All right. Um, you have a problem getting, uh, this is from Bob Franklin. Problem, I have getting, problem getting a theory I know how to translate to the fretboard. It just seems to get in the way and I spend more time thinking about, oh, and less time just playing. Yeah, well, that's a great question, Bob. Everybody. Um, so here's the idea. Take one idea and just work on that, like the theory stuff. So there's practice and there's playing. I don't think about theory when I'm playing. I just think about it when I'm practicing. Or I think about an idea that I want to work on. So let's just say you're concentrating on um, hitting the thirds of a chord, right? Then I will just think about that. I'll just practice that. That would be the one thing I want to add into my playing. So I found if I just take the one idea and then build upon that, that makes it much easier than trying to dive in and do all this stuff, right? Um, that's, that's one thing that really worked for me because too much information is going to kill you too. So just the one little idea. And then when you feel like, oh, I'm a little confident in that. Okay, I think I got that under my fingers. Then add in a second of this. And you have two things that are new to your playing. And then you start to build that and build that. Um, but it's the man hours that you put in, or woman hours, the, <laughs> the personage hours, um, that you put in ahead of time. 
that before the gig that you know will do it and also sometimes uh you know things you practice now might not make it to when you're performing uh until a little bit of time because you're just not internalized yet so you have to be a little patient with it but the main thing is to take one idea and then practice over the tunes you intend to play and then you can have some ideas uh, like copy like work out say licks because licks can be a little a little bit of a trap because if you mess it up then you, you then you get in your headset like oh, i messed that lick up and um but if you can work out a few ideas over something in one of your tunes and work on pr putting those into your practice and your playing and then they'll start to come out when you're gigging um, or even playing at home you know there's a difference between practice and playing um, other little things that I've done in the past is you got your pedal board you know and once I might, might put a little note to myself like play that was my friend Chris Amlar's idea years ago he would put notes on his thing like you w just to remind you to play that thing you've been working on so sometimes a little mental reminder is cool but the main thing for me one idea work on the one idea then bring in the next idea right then you know then you bring in the next idea so that's that's how I do it because I know I look I know way more than I play even as well because this the genre and the style of music I play doesn't I'm not playing the modes of melodic minor all that much okay um all right ba -ba -ba. Okay, this is uh, Graham Ross. I've been practice, practicing the pentatonic helix for an hour a day with my, and my left hand is getting a little sore. Let go away. Okay, let's talk about that for a minute. Just kind of found in questions here. So we've got this, you know, you've got the, when you talk about the pentatonic helix thing, is one of my pentatonic lockdowns. Um, so you practice the scale in like a helix method where you're going up one finger and down the other, and then you circle around the fingerboard, and that's a great way to practice it. Well, the first thing I would say is um, take some breaks. Like if you're practicing in an hour a day, that's a lot. Um, I've had a lot of hand problems, and I still sometimes do get them. Um, nothing that's been career-threatening, but enough where it's uh, painful or, and also where I have to take some breaks from playing guitar. Um, so I stretch before I play. All right, let's talk about those. Everybody's like, what kind of stretches? Simple, gentle ones like this. I'll just gently pull my hand back like this you know um so just say so i kind of feel it same here this way like that right stretch like that this here the other one that works really great for me because my i get problems in my neck and um i sometimes get problems in this finger from a sort of a pinch nerve because we sit like this all day i sit at a computer i teach you know slouching so one thing that works great for me is I just pull my shoulders back and stretch like this. And I found that this has been a really interestingly, really great one and not that hard. Or in a doorway, doing that before I play or in between. And I just get up and I make sure I take a lot of breaks. So practicing for an hour, like what else would you do for like an hour? Would you run for an hour? So if your hands are hurting, Graham, it will go away. But you're doing something a little wrong then in that sense. You're probably overdoing it. And um, if you practice the scales with intent and you practice them properly, like with a metronome and you're thinking about your technique, you don't necessarily have to play that for an hour a day because I think that sounds, um, I understand it, but those are the things that led me to have hand problems as well. So I would just kind of back off a little bit, take more breaks, maybe practice it 20 minutes a day or 15 minutes, then come back to it later in the day and go through it again. I think that's the best goal you should shoot for. Um, hey, thanks, Phil, for doing such a great job as, as well. All these questions down at the bottom. All right, awesome. Um, uh, I'll let you guys all talk to each other, too. It's awesome. All right, so this is from um, Jim DeVore. Do you have any pearls of wisdom for the right hand, muting, it's, muting rhythm, etc.? Sure, sure. Um, first thing is the the right hand is my timekeeper right so if i'm doing you know right this is always going or whether i'm playing like
this right hand is what's keeping the time for me. So I'm thinking like, well, out of tune right now. There it is. New strings. There we go. Okay. So the right hand is what's keeping the time. So it's got to be loose. And I think that it's, it's, <laughs> it's loose enough that, uh, and I hold my pick loose enough so it doesn't fly out of my fingers. So the Zen approach back to the beginning thing is I just hold the pick firmly enough that I need to so I don't drop it. And that it flexes in my fingers and moves. So there's a lot of, um, so it's nice and loose. If I have a stiff wrist and I'm holding on to the pick, you're know, like, <coughs> yeah, right? But if I do, you see, I'm almost like, you know, you're stirring a pot or something like that. And the big, the big, like, not an exaggeration, but like Steve Ray Vaughan, you watch him play, it's all there too. But any guitar player, man, they've got to have this right hand is always kind of going. So, when I'm thinking about muting on that, um, that is largely left hand, right? So, but my hand is sort of getting all the strings, but I'm not going. Which it would sound like if I didn't mute with my left hand. So the first finger is coming down and flopping down. I'm just kind of going over here and, and um, making sure that the left hand is doing a lot, the majority of the work when it comes to the muting, but the right hand is really keeping it nice and loose. So whether it's that or if I'm just going to do um, even like a rock thing, you know, like, you know, like... <laughs> Wait, this thing is always kind of going, you know, whether I'm not even playing all that. But like, let me try to kind of get that idea. Like, this is still kind of going, chicka, 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 whether I play it or not. And I lift up the right hand sort of like a record needle. And if it's a funk thing, you know. Right, so this is keeping it going. This is the time, and that's, um, that's the most important thing. The muting, like I said, will come from the left hand uh, for that kind of stuff. But for, you know, the rock stuff, the muting is also going to be here. It's a little bit of a, a bounce at times. <laughs> like, you know... You know, we're not talking the Metallica kind of stuff, like that kind of thing, where that's a different kind of muting technique. Um, it's really just keeping the wrist nice and loose. Um, the bigger stuff, it's like I'm throwing my wrist around a little bit. Right? As opposed to... It's never going to sound good with a stiff arm. Ever. Ever, 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 ever. Right? So it's always... Well, maybe one guy can do that. Most people I know don't. And then you get kind of, you, you start to focus in on what string set you want to get. So say if I want to do like a funky thing um, in the middle strings, right? So, uh, right, so this kind of thing like that. That hand is still going, and I'm really focusing more on those inner tunes. Um, all right, there's a riff on one of my record called It's Your, it's Your Groove. I played it last night on the two-rock thing I did over at, uh, on Truefire. I'm going to post those videos. I did these uh, three videos that were pre-recorded. I'm going to post them here on the channel so we can see them. But like this... Um, Right, this is, you know, not going. Right, not doing that, because that's never going to sound good. Uh, the, the rhythm of the song and where the group, the beats sit properly, up beats, uh, off beats, or 16th notes, are coming from right over here, right? Right? from 
that right hand is always keeping it together. All right, some more questions. Um, hopefully that was help, helpful. Um, how often do you practice a quiet volume versus louder volume as part of the ready to play for a venue? That is an excellent question. Tom, um, I almost never practice loud. I live in New York City. I would not be very popular if I practice loud at all. Majority of my practicing, I am using a plug-in because I, I, you know, what am I going to do, crank it? I also have a bit of tinnitus, you know, from years of playing guitar and uh, playing loud really messes with it. So I'm an earplug fanatic. So playing loud at home, uh, forget it. First of all, it's just my neighbors, I just can't do it. And um, I can't handle it. Like, honestly, physically, I just can't handle it. <laughs> Let's <laughs> forget it. Um, so on a gig, I just got to roll with it, you know? I don't like playing too loudly. When I played with Robin, he was very loud uh, in an awesome way. So it took a little while for me to get used to that, that I had to get used to his volume. Because, you know, it's his gig, so he sets all of it. And he started playing, and I was like, oh, my God. Like, I haven't played that loud uh, maybe ever or since, you know, touring in metal bands. Um, so... Uh, there's nothing like playing loud. It's the best, you know, in terms of uh, the interaction between you and the amp and the guitar and the circuit. That's the best part, especially if you're using overdrive. You know, David Gilmore referred to it as that pillow of sound that you lay back into. And it's just the best. Um, you can't prepare for it. I can't, not in New York. If I, maybe if I lived and I had like a, a house and a, a basement, I could practice with that. But then I probably wouldn't end up doing it anyway because my ears ring at the drop of a hat anyway. Well, they never stop ringing, <laughs> uh, but it's not too bad. And if I'm not careful, it gets bad. So there you go. Um, wow, we've done an hour. Still people hanging in. All right, all right, I'll go for a little while longer because these are all really good questions. Thank you. Um, Leo, uh, thank you. You got into Solo Explorer and you're enjoying it. Thanks so much. I really appreciate um, uh that quite a bit. I really like that course. And people ask me, like, you know, what are you thinking about when you're soloing? Uh, it's that course. Solo Explorer is my latest one. I really, that's the course if you want to kind of dig into what I'm thinking as a rock player. All right. Um, when improvising, you may, um, are you mainly visualizing chord tones you want to hit in scales and shapes or chord tones? This is from Craig. Uh, let me uh, understand the criterion. So when you're improvising, are you mainly visualizing the chord tones you want to hit within a scale shapes or chord shapes? Uh, kind of. I'm not thinking so much shapes. Um, through lots of practice, I don't think about shapes as much as I used to. So, yes. Um, that saying, of course I think about shapes because we're guitar players and guitar player, guitars are, I just contradict myself, but guitar players are very shape-oriented because we can be, but it's not the thing I mainly focus in on. Chord tones, yes. I will think about what note and what chord I'm on and how I want to resolve to that and what are my surrounding notes. And the way Solo Explorer, if you want to, if you want that, the course is exactly talking about this, how I see it. I almost see everything is based around a pentatonic scale and what notes in my pentatonic scale do I need to use to match the chord progression if I have some other chord tones or if something changes keys a little bit. Not talking about dramatic key changes where things change keys all the time. I'm talking about your basic rock and roll chord progressions where you may have one or two twists and turns in the chord progression. And that's how I'll approach it. I'll see everything as a pentatonic scale because I love, you know, because I just love that, right? So I'm going to try to bring it back to that. I don't only think in terms of pentatonics, in terms of sound, I think of chord tones, but I feel like if I take my pentatonic scale and add in some chord tones, uh, it turns out to be the mode or a scale. But if I think of a scale, I start playing very scale-y. And I don't like the sound of that. So I'm always thinking about chord tones and I'm always thinking about triads. So um, hopefully that answers that. So Solo Explorer, my course over at Truefire. You can get it at my website, jeffmackerling.com. Um, that really digs into that. And uh, so there you go, yeah. <laughs> um, all right. Um, not a lot of questions. Okay. This is from uh, Baby John. 
Have you got any particular routines you recommend for daily practice to develop t a core technique, left hand picking, right hand? Uh, yes, uh, practicing with a metronome. Great place to start. Three note per string. If your pentatonic scales with a metronome, quarter notes, triplets, sixteenth notes, eighth notes. Um, if you're really good with your pentatonics and major scale fingerings, dig into three note per string major scale fingerings with a metronome, and then find. A background track of some kind of thing in the same key, and then play over that because that gives you a format and a basis to you hear the music in the scales at that point. So you do the technical. I've got my metronome at 80 beats per minute, doing up to 16th notes. Okay, I got 16th notes. Okay, let me move it a little further, nudge it ahead, keep a track, keeping track of where you are. A little post-it note, you know, with what you've been working on. Put it on your computer, wherever you work. So okay, today I was at 90. Let's see what I can do today. You move it up. Um, make sure your technique is good. You know, all these things we've talked about and we'll talk about, you know, is your pick angle right? Are you, you know, does it sound good? Are you practicing musically? Uh, and then play it over a background track. So then you can hear the, the scale in context. But um, a daily routine, I don't say I practice my scales every day. I would be lying. Uh, I try to practice them a lot. I will run scales every day, but I don't necessarily much have the, um, the time to, I have to make the time to do that stuff. Okay, so um, uh, so I get text there. Text from Truefire. Oh, yeah. Oh, guys. Oh, yeah. I just want to bring this up. <coughs> if you go to Truefire, um, there's a, a rhythm guitar workshop uh, boot camp you can sign up for. It's for tomorrow, and it's free. And it's with me and Corey Congilio and Andy Timmons. So it should be fun. Um, let's go to truefire.com. It's right on the homepage, uh, rhythm guitar boot camp. Check it out. It's free. You got to sign up for it, though, and uh, should be fun trying some new stuff out with it. Um, okay. Eh, eh, eh. Okay, Tom and Ed. People say it doesn't matter how you hold the pick, and that everyone does it differently. It seems like the meat of my fingers is hitting the strings. Uh, thoughts. Um, well, uh, it does matter how you hold a pick. Um, <laughs> I mean, there are some people that do it differently. I mean, Eddie Van Halen holds it like this, and you can't say, you know, anything wrong about him. And there's all sorts of guys. <coughs> the main thing would be that you want to hold it at some sort of angle. So it's slicing across the string at sort of like a 35, 45 degree angle. So just so you're not picking perpendicular to the string. Because if you do that... It's really easy to, well, I can't. I'm picking perpendicular. First of all, it sounds terrible. But if I try to play fast, I get stuck up in a string. Now, in terms of how much pick I have hanging out, I don't have a lot of focus on here, but it's kind of where I'm at. Like, I'm kind of holding it that far out. You've got to kind of experiment with it. It sounds like you're probably choking up a bit too much if you're hitting the meat of your fingers all the time. You're probably choking up on the string too much, on the pick too much. Um, but it does matter. Clearly, it matters, right? You know? <laughs> okay. Um, I do want to say thanks to everyone. I know Phil has texted me a few times. I? Okay. I want to say thanks to everyone who uh, joined me today for my sort of little stream of consciousness thing at the top there. Um, this... Saturday morning, Josh Smith is going to be on the show on the Brooklyn Lockdown Conversation, so I'm totally psyched about that. Josh is a friend and, as you know, a spectacular guitar player, and he's going to teach a little bit, and we're just going to talk about music. And we can talk about some of this stuff um, in here. So uh, Josh Smith on Saturday morning at 11 a.m. Eastern Time. So I'm missing the question here from my good friend, Ermano. I've been alerted, so I've got to go through this. Uh, kind of hard for me. All right. Where is that question? Uh, uh, uh. Hey, Phil, can you shoot me that question again? I'm, I'm not seeing that. Yeah, I, don't, I can't find it. This is really difficult to read all these things. Oh, we're mono. Okay, okay. Um, hey, Jeff, can you do a new course about live streaming? <laughs> um, 
Well, it's pretty funny because Hermano Bonifazi, who's my friend who's on here, um, he runs the Umbria Blues Festival, and I've done that. I've done that. Did that. Done that. Uh, the first year was with Matt Schofield and David Grissom. That was a ton of fun. And um, I know it's not a question. He was only joking. Um, and then last year it was with Josh Smith and Ariel Posen and myself. And this year it was supposed to have been uh, me and uh, I believe Andy Wood and I forget who else was on the bill. So we're going to see what happens next year. Obviously, you know, everything got kind of messed up. But Hermano has been, w you know, instrumental in uh, um, helping me set up my live stream as as clean and as uh, as as well as it comes out so i definitely appreciate uh, all his help um all right so thanks to everybody i saw some stuff in the tip chart i really appreciate it really appreciate everybody being here i'm glad to be back um i'll get back to doing some more teaching as opposed to um the, the more of the stream of consciousness stuff hopefully I answered some of your questions today um and uh i'll see you saturday morning 11 a.m eastern time with josh smith and uh, go to TrueFire if you want, TrueFire.com. Sign up for the boot camp uh, for tomorrow. I think it's at 6 p.m. I'm up first. Then after me is Annie Timmons, who's great. And of course, and Corey Congilio is great. And it's free. You just have to sign up for it. Give it a shot. But we're trying to see some new stuff over there. And um, I think it'll be a ton of fun. So just go over to TrueFire.com. It's just like right on the homepage. And also, um, my Essentials Blues course that you uh, have right there. 40% uh, off if you go to jeffmackerlane.com, the link there, and there you go. And I will see all of you guys then. Thanks so much, everybody. I really appreciate it. And uh, see you then. Thanks. Bye.